Okay, it is April 3rd, Wednesday. We're picking up in Revelation 20 and verse 1. We're doing a very quick review, and it will be a shorter class than sometimes because we were dealing with Passover and other things. So uh, just know it's a complete, if you're, if you're short, if it's one CD this time, it's because we, we went a little shorter. Okay, um, we have been looking at the fact that the Millennial Kingdom, this period shown by the circle here, is... <coughs> literal is real and is 1,000 years, which is what millennial means. We looked last week and said that there are those who say it's just an allegory and it won't happen. It's not to be taken literally. We discounted that. We looked at those who said that after the millennial time, that's when the, the, the Lord returns and there's this fulfillment, uh, that the church has to rule and reign and, and prepare the world for the coming of Messiah. We saw how that's not true because in Revelation 19, that in chapter 19, he comes to the Battle of Armageddon, which is from northern uh, Israel way down into the south. We saw it's in Megiddo, Armageddon. It's in uh, the Valley of Jehoshaphat. It's in Jerusalem. It's in Bozrah. Uh, Edom comes up. The, God brings back from Edom those that I believe he has hidden. So we see it covers a massive area. We see that he comes back with a sword out of his mouth that annihilates the enemies of Israel on the mountains of Jerusalem, that the Antichrist and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. Where do you see a beautiful surrounding? Everybody's praising the Lord, serving the Lord, and ready for Messiah. You don't see that. I think what brings in the confusion is the scripture that says that the Lord won't return until they say, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They also say that God said to, to Yeshua Jesus, sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So they're expecting that all those enemies have been made a footstool and then he comes. On the basis of that, I think they're misunderstanding because it is, those are right, but it's all happening at the same time. When the Lord does return and is seen from east to west like the lightning in the sky, is at that point when he's coming back that they see the nail-pierced hands. This is Zechariah 12, 10. When they see, they're going to mourn for me as one mourns for his only son. They're going to realize, whoa, he was, he is our Messiah. Now, who are these who are going to so quickly see that? I believe they're ones who the seed has been planted in their hearts. They've been being witnessed to by the 144,000. They've seen the two witnesses and what they've done. They've been coming to that point, but they, and for those who have come to that point and have believed and have accepted, they are the ones, because we're going to see very shortly the people who go into the millennial, who come out of the tribulation and go into the millennial will only be the believers. The others, we're going to look at a sheep and goat judgment of Matthew 25. The goats are going to be left out. The sheep are going to go into the kingdom. They're the ones who are believing. So who is going to be saying it? The 144,000, because they're still on this earth. Those that have been evangelized by them that have come to believe and have not been martyred. We know that a great majority of their number will be martyred and will be up in the heavens in, in a different position than those on the earth. But those who have managed to make it to this point have not been martyred and I think are coming to that point, even by virtue of all that's been happening around them, that it's, it's going to all come together and they are going to realize and they will be the ones crying out and saying that. It's not a worldwide saying it, but there will be those who are saying it. And in essence, God has made the enemies the Lord's footstool by that point through his pouring out of the wrath that has judged the sin. The Lord just, in essence, finishes it off, just puts the final touches on uh, because it immediately stops. He doesn't come back and have to battle for a day or a month or you know two weeks or anything. I mean, it's immediate in his return that the fighting stops. You know, they're fighting each other. They're fighting for the land called Israel. They turn on him, and he just that's it. They're gone, and they're gone by the power of God who is working through his son, who is equal to him, that in that role of Messiah, which means. We're seeing him in his deity because the Messiah that's going to come and sit on David's throne is the Messiah who took on human form. 
to fulfill the need of a sacrifice for mankind. The first Adam condemned us all. The second Adam is who can save us all. But he can't save us if he's not of us. In other words, he can't be an angel and save the human race. He had to be human. He had to take on human form. We know that he did. We know that he came into the Jewish race. We know that the promise was to the Jewish race. The Messiah would come from the loins of David, David. We know it goes further back than that, but I'm just taking it from King David because uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7 talks about how David will always have someone on his throne. We know the Lord is sitting on his throne in, in heaven right now on the right hand of God the Father. Remember the beautiful love seat? And we see everybody around praising. But we're talking about the earthly. Because remember when we looked at this millennial period and we said this is literal, then all of these promises will be fulfilled to Israel. Literally. Where do we see them? In Isaiah, in Zechariah, in John's words, in Daniel's words. Remember I said in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. If you're going into a court, you want as many eyewitnesses or as many testimonies as you can get. That weighs heavily on a jury. This one says they saw it. This one says this is what's going to happen. Well, this one is agreeing with that one, and this one's saying the same thing too. Well, by the time you add up all of that, you've got a lot of evidence that proves your point. Why is that so important? Because if God isn't going to do what he said he was going to do when Yeshua Isaiah recorded his words, if he's not going to do what he said through Zechariah, if he's not going to do what he said for Yohanan, and for Daniel and Daniel, Daniel especially, because he gave that whole scope of prophecy, and he related it to Daniel's people. And when we went through the book of Daniel, we saw that the many in the book of Daniel are the Jewish people. These are the promises made to the Jewish people as a nation. And if God does not fulfill what he told through all of these prophets and through a couple more that we're going to add to the list today, then wow, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to trust God with my salvation. If he changed his mind back here, and you could say, well, that's because the Jews were bad and they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Well, hello, Christians. How good are we? Are we doing what we should be doing? You know, it, it, it's the church on display for the world to see and say, wow, look at them. No, we're not doing, I don't think, any better. Maybe we're doing a little bit. No, I really can't even say that because there, were, there was always the faithful Jewish remnant. And there's always the faithful believing remnant today. And I, I use believing there, you notice I didn't say Gentile, even though this is the time that we know is called the times of the Gentiles. I didn't use that word on purpose because this body of believers today is Jew and Gentile. The same way back under law, the Gentiles were brought in. Well, now it's not under law, it's under grace, and the Jewish people are brought in. Same way as the Gentiles are on equal footing. They come to the Messiah, they come to the Lord, they come for salvation through the shed blood on the cross. The yeah, same way. New creation. It, it, right. It's the one new man. It is the one new man. That's exactly what I'm saying. Ephesians chapter 2. It right. is the one new man. You can have a Gentile leg and you can have a Jewish leg yeah. and you got one body. Yeah. <laughs> you can't walk on one leg. You can hop, but you can't walk. So for walking is one new man in the Messiah, Jesus, whichever name you call him. When I say Yeshua, I'm giving you his Hebrew name. In English, that's Jesus. He's one and the same. The only name ever for salvation from here to here, the only name of salvation. So we're not teaching dual covenant theology, which says the Jews get saved one way, the Gentiles get saved another way. We're not teaching that says, oh, the Jews have it in. You know, they're God's favorite people. So no problem, no worries. Oh, Jewish people, you have to have personal salvation. Gentile people, personal salvation. One way, Yeshua Jesus. No dual covenant but also no replacement theology. Yes. And yeah, I'm going to get on my right. sandbox or my, right my soapbox. <laughs> Not sand, soap. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over and it's going to be firm and I'm going to stand on it and I'm going to preach it loud, far, yes. and long because I keep hearing it out there. 
Well, God's done with the Jews. They rejected their Messiah. It was bad enough that, that they didn't like him. It was bad enough that they didn't go along with him, but they called out for him to be crucified. Guess what? The Romans crucified him. The Jews called for it. Whose sins put him on that cross? Jew, Gentile, free, slave, black, white, boy, girl, man, woman. I don't care what you put there. We all are the ones who put him there. But literally, actually, we didn't even do that. Because I'm going to take you one step backward. And you're going to hear how he willingly, he was God. He could have looked at them and said, and they were gone. When he claimed who he was in the garden, he answered, I am. They fell on their tuchas. If you don't know that word in Yiddish, you can make it. <laughs> Just by virtue saying who it was. He willingly, he didn't fight them, he didn't run from them, he didn't have to be captured, they didn't have to have ten people on top of him when he put out his arms and died on the cross willingly. Come with me to Passover Seder in the next couple of weeks and see that picture in a way that you have never seen it before. If it's your first time, there is a moment that you're going to go, <gasps> And I mean, you hear it. When you have enough new people in the room, you hear it. Because it so hits. It's so impactful. It was so planned and so prepared by our mighty God. The Lord willingly laid down his life. No greater love hath this than a man laid down his life for his friends. Wow. And the beauty of it. He didn't need to die for himself. He put that blood to our account. And God raised him from the dead. Resurrection power, that is what he enables us to move in today. Gives us our salvation. Gives us our ability to do anything for the Lord today. We've got the best of the best of the best. It is amazing. But God, in his magnanimous plan, never, never, Got up off that throne and said, I go, Father, I've got a problem. I got a man in his den. What am I going to do? I. He never said, Oh, plan B. No. He said, Before the foundations of the world, eternity past that we don't understand, before this point, before Adam, the first man, he said, I died for you. I wrote your name in the book of life from the foundations of the world. That was before he put man in that world. It didn't catch him off guard. He didn't say, bad Jews, you let me down. Now I've got to come up with another plan. No, he said, I know you're not going to do it. Just the same way he told through Moshe, go read Deuteronomy chapter 32, Song of Moses, Song of Moshe. Moshe, it's time. You're going to go into the land. You're finally going to make it. You've wandered for 40 years. Why? Because of unbelief. Unbelief is not pleasing to God. Yeah. You want to displease God? Just don't believe him. That's it, right there. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. That generation did not believe. They listened to the bad report of the ten spies. They did not listen to the two godly men, Yahshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb, they didn't listen to them. Hey, we can't take the land. There's giants in the land. Don't we have a giant God? I have a great need. I got a great God to meet that need. But they didn't listen. And because of their unbelief, after all God had done, parted the Red Sea, fed them every day, mom from heaven, he's feeding them, he's taking care of them because of their unbelief. They were not allowed to go into the promised land. This generation is going to die off. I'm raising up the new generation. Moshe, you don't get to take them in because you also were disobedient. He did something that marred a picture that God wanted for people of all time. He was showing the rock that was struck once is Yeshua. By striking that rock that second time, he, he ruined the picture and he also was as if he were doing something instead of the glory belonging to God and God alone. 
It wasn't we must do something, it was God would do it. So God harshly dealt with Moshe and said, you don't get to take them in. <clears throat> but I'll let you see. He'll bring them right up to that point, I'll let you see. And then Yeshua is going to take them in. Interesting. Moshe, Moses represents the law. The law could not save. Joshua's name means God saves. That's the one who takes them in. Because he's a picture of the Lord. But here they are. They're ready. They're on the precipice of going into the promised land. And he gives Moshe a whole list of what to say. When you go into the land, when you're in the land of milk and honey, when you're in the land of plenty, don't forget me. Because that's what people do. When you're in your plenty, watch out because that's when you'll forget your God. When you're in desperate needs, oh, God, help. You know, we're all on our knees, and we're all crying out. We're all talking to him all day long. But when things are going well, we tend to forget. So he warned them. But he did one thing further. He told them through Moses, I'm warning you not to forget, but you are going to forget. You're going to do this, and you're going to do that, and this is going to happen because of it. See, God knew it. He knew all along because he's made us. He knows what sin has done to us. He knows how our hearts are. Uh, and I'm talking mankind all the way through time. He knew. He knew Adam and Eve were going to have a problem in the garden. You think if anybody else would have done any better, he wouldn't have put them there instead. <laughs> but he knew. And he allowed it anyway because if we did not have that free will, we would be puppets, we would be robots, we wouldn't be coming to God with a heart that wants to worship. I worship you. I love you. I will do. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, I love you. You are awesome and wonderful and amazing. Your name is, my favorite word, ineffable. And I come out of a heart of appreciation and I weep tears of joy and I fall on my face and I worship and adore my God. And I tell him every day, oh, Lord, I want to love you more today than I did yesterday. I want to be head over heels in love with you. I want all my life to count for you. Yes. That pleases him. That and our prayers, even when we're crying out in earnest to our Abba, our Daddy, that pleases him. Not because we have to, you know, pull the, the string and, and say the command, you know, I love you. I'm hungry. Change me. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. No, no. But he wanted that interaction. And he shows us that all the way back from creation. If I follow through and teach Genesis next, just wait till we get to that beginning. The love God had for his human that he created, the intimacy he wanted from that beginning. Bear sheet. Oh, it's amazing. And he enters into a special relationship called the Shabbat, the Sabbath. And he says, on the Sabbath, remember, I'm your God who created. I created all of this for you, and I created you. And then I show you how to enter into relationship with me. And when I get into the Hebrew in that, oh, wow. <laughs> it's amazing. But that's my classics. So let me move on. <laughs> God knew they were going to fall. It didn't stop him. He had a plan of redemption. Bereshit 3.15, Genesis 3.15, the first prophecy telling us that one would come who would save us from the curse of sin that came on all humankind when Adam fell. So here we are, Israel. You're going to go into the land, but you're going to be rebellious. You're going to forget me. You're going to get so far off base, you're going to bring in other idols. You're going to forget your Shabbat. You're going to deal harshly with your fellow brethren, let alone the world. You're not going to be my mouthpiece to the world. You're not going to be a nation of priests to the world. You're not going to take the gospel message out. So I'm going to allow you to suffer some consequences because you've taken yourself out from under my umbrella protection. So when it's raining out here and the umbrella is over here, whose fault is it that you're getting wet? You know, who moved who where? Okay, come back in. But because you're out there, I'm going to take what was here, and I'm going to offer it to the Gentiles in the same way that you can get it now, and I'm going to allow them to 
take it. As we see right now, most of the world missionaries are Gentile to the Gentiles right now. It's the time of the Gentiles. Now, don't exclude the Jews because Romans 1.16 says that the, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and the salvation for all who believe to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And it's simply meant as an order, not a second class. God didn't say they're second class, just the order. So he put it in that way. And even with the Gentiles, he's saying, go to the Jew. Take it to the Jew. Who is the great apostle to the Gentiles? Paul. Paul. Where do you see Paul every Shabbat? In the, in the synagogues. Where do you see when he goes to start a new church plant? Where do you see him go? To the synagogues. He sees how many Jewish people he can start the nucleus with. Then he adds in the believing Gentiles. In some cases, it's more Gentile than Jewish. And in time, it definitely is more Gentile than Jewish. And unfortunately, because of animosity and other problems that came in, there are those in that Gentile world that started to say, we anathemize anything Jewish. You can't do that. Forget that. You Jews, leave it all. Don't hold on to any of your heritage. Don't hold on to any of your culture. You need to become a good Gentile Christian. And the world buys it because Satan's behind that. That's the beginning yeah. of replacement theology. Yeah, the you Jews were bad. That stuff's all bad. It, it was rejected. It was finished. God turned his back on you now. That's why you raised up Paul to the Gentiles. Well, if God turned his back on the Jews, then why is Paul in the synagogue reaching the Jews first? Why does Paul say to the Jew first? Why does Paul, when he gets fed up in that one city and wipes the dust off of his feet and says, I'm done with the Jews, if he meant no more to the Jews, no message to Jews, no salvation for the Jews, I'm going strictly to the Gentiles, I'll have nothing to do with the Jews, so why in the very next chapter, the very next community he comes into, where do we find him? In the synagogue. Well, Paul thought you were done with them. No, I was done with those Jews there because they were so hard hearted. The work wasn't going to be accomplished today, so I went to the Gentiles there, and now I've moved to a new area, and I'm checking in this area. Do I have soft-hearted Jews? Where's my Jewish ones going to come to believe? And it goes on. We've got nucleuses of churches started now, and if you want the Jewish way of saying it, it was a Messianic community. That was what it was called at first, a called-out assembly. The name church that's so Gentilized today is not the name that was given back then. You don't find church in scripture. You find called out assembly. Well, who were the believers in, quote, Old Testament, which I call original? Who were the believers? The called out assembly. The ones who God called out. They made up the commonwealth of Israel, but not everybody of Israel. In Israel was of Israel. What did that mean? That means that there were those who were not believers, who were not part of it. But God always keeps his remnant. Always, always, always. And God said, during this time, with Abraham, with Yitzhak, with Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, with uh, to Moses, he said during this time, I'm going to make you a promise. I'm promising you this land. I'm going to put my name on this land. We all know today that's called Israel. That is Jerusalem, Israel, and all surrounding around Israel. God said, I'm putting my name there. So you got a problem with that land belonging to Israel, belonging to God? Take it up with God. <laughs> he said it. He didn't put his name on anything he wants because you know what? It all belongs to him. It's all his. And he sectioned off one little bit. And he showed all the way back with Abraham, who gave tithes to Melchizedek. My God is king. This one was a picture of Yeshua. We don't see his beginning, we don't see his end, but we see Abram offer him tithes, and uh, what we see in, in like our communion service today, the bread and the wine, we see offered to him because of his position, because he's being a picture of the Messiah, of the one who's coming. God said, I'm promising that land to you, to your ancestors, but I'm promising something greater. I'm promising the seed will come through you. Hmm. See, what seed is he talking about? Well, let's go back to Bereshit, Genesis 3.15, when it says that there will be enmity between her seed and Satan. What's that? A woman? Seed? I thought the male has the seed. Hmm. 
is there something original going on here? Is that an indication of what Yeshai calls virgin birth? Because what kind of a sign is it that a young maiden will conceive? Hello. Young maidens conceive all the time, every day, all over the world. But a virgin conceiving without a man? That's a sign. That's something that stands out. And I promised it through the Jewish phrase. So he'll be out of the seed of Abraham, Yisach, and Yaakov, and finally through David, David, and on down through the line. Why, Matthew had to be a witness. Matthew, our first book in what's called the New Covenant, that's simply a continuation of the story. One story, his story. You pronounce it history his story, <laughs> one story, and Matthew lays down very clearly. You, with your Jewish mind, take a peek at that forbidden side. Wait a minute, what's all my ancestors doing in there? Why are you calling about my, uh, talking about my great, 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 great granddaddy? <laughs> Maybe it's okay for me to read this. And as they read, they come through and they see the Messiah fulfilling Isaiah 53, Psalm 22. We see Proverbs 30 and verse 4. It says that God has a son. Can you name him? Psalm 2 verse 8 says, Do homage to the son. Kiss him, lest he be angry with you. Who's that talking about? How can the psalmist David in Psalm 110 say, The Lord said unto my Lord. Wait a minute. How do we have two lords? <laughs> Very easy when you've got the Lord above. All the way through, all of this is clicking, all this is coming down, all of this is important to get all the way through this church age to here because it's in this time here that these promises are being given. Where Isaiah is saying, and I'll read it for you, Isaiah 11, 1, then a shoe will spring from the stem of Jesse, Jesse. Jesse just happened to be Jewish. <laughs> he just happened to have the privilege of being David, David's dad. Okay, that's what we're talking about. There's going to be a shoot that's going to spring. That's, in essence, like when we're talking about our family tree, there's going to be a new shoot. There's going to be a new addition. The branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. There's a first indication. Oh, wait a minute. This isn't just a normal shoot. This is a special shoot. It goes through things, fear of wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make his decisions by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor. What have we read in Revelation? That the Lord is coming back and dealing righteously. That he's going to make right and fair and just all that's been wrong to the poor to the oppressed. That's what we're reading here. He's going to decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. Remember when he comes back? It's been a worldwide tribulation. That's the difference from every called tribulation of all time. The Holocaust. They say, oh, well, that was the tribulation. No. It was a tribulation. It was located in one area. Take that multiply it on steroids and send it worldwide and now you have the tribulation worldwide all of this he comes and stops so he's going to be dealing with the entire world and we won't get there today because Rochelle's too long-winded but when we do get there we'll see that the nations come into the millennium there is a head nation Israel but there are going to be other peoples that come into that nation also that will receive blessings through Israel. Hmm. Oh, Bereshit, Genesis 12, 3. I will bless them that bless you. I will curse them that curse you. I will make you, and I'm saying it in my words now, a large family, but my point is, and through you will be the blessing of the nations. God promised to bless the nations all along. You weren't a second thought. You weren't plan B. It was to go to you all. So all of that is going to be fulfilled. And if he's not going to do that, then I don't want any part of what I'm believing and teaching and preaching here if he's not going to keep what he says here. And if he's not going to fulfill what he promised these. And if he's not going to...
do what he told Adam and Eve, then God help us all. Because where are we if we cannot think on his grace, his mercy, and his word? But we can, and I know we can, and I put, hallelujah, yes, and I put my whole life on it. So here we go now looking at the proof that there is a millennial kingdom. The proof that God's fulfilling his word. The proof that he's going to do for the Jewish nation what Isaiah said he'd do. What Zechariah said he would do. What Yohanan said he would do. So remember, Yohanan's Jewish. Yeah, he's the last book in our Bible, the author of it, Revelation. But he's Jewish, remember? In that, I believe every book of the Bible was written by Jewish people. There's one they want to argue with, and that's Luke. But I think Luke was a Hellenistic Jew, which is a Greek-speaking, Greek background Jew. I think he was a Gentile. <laughs> our Jewish part Gentile put together. Okay, all right. But here we are now, and we're in this. And we looked last week at Isaiah. What I just read that I hurried through, and I won't even go through all verse nine. But verse six talks about the wolf lying with the dwelling with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion together. And my mom would always say, so you got the lion and the lamb lying together, and the lamb is not lying in the lion's stomach. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got that promise that we don't have now. You have those promises. Israel has longed for those promises. The earth has longed for the promises. Do you know the earth is moaning? It's moaning under the curse of sin, too, that it wants to be released from also. We're moaning. Oh, Lord, God, how much longer do we have to endure? The ones who've been martyred are under the throne, and their number's going to swell like nobody's business in the tribulation. So many they can't be numbered. And they're crying out, how long, oh, God, how long until you avenge our blood? The blood that was shed because they believed in Yeshua, Jesus. They had the testimony, and they kept the commandments of God. I see in that um, the, belief, the, the believing remnant. So this is why it's so important. We see it as one book, one story. We see it as a complete. There is not a replacement. God didn't change his mind. He didn't turn from it and say, forget this. How many times have we done that? Tried to do a plan. It didn't work. We gave up we, and moved on. Well, that's human. That's because we can't to pull it all off. We can't do everything we want. We get grand ideas and they fall flat. That's human. Our God is not human. Praise God, he's not. If I was believing in another human, again, God help me. Because I don't care how good the best human is, they're going to let you down. They're going to fail. They're going to die. But I've got a God who is great. I've got a God who lives forever. I've got a God who had it all planned from the start. I've got a God who does not fail. Amen. And when he says every word will be fulfilled, every word will be fulfilled. Yeah. So how do we get the millennium? By the coming of the Messiah. You can't have peace on this earth for a thousand years without Messiah sitting on the throne. This earth has never known peace. It will never know peace until he rules with that rod of iron. So we looked at that last week. That was in Isaiah, Zechariah, and Yohanan. We see that he's coming back to rule, to reign, to be king Messiah. That also was promised in the original covenant. He's taking care of the sacrifice side now. He came humbly. He came low. He came riding on the donkey. He didn't come with the entourage to do a king. But now, Matthew 24, 30, we saw from the east to the west, he was seen. He has come back in his glory. He has come back with the armies with him. Remember, that's us. Mm -hmm. He's come back to stop the enemies of Israel, to set up the temple, to put his glory in that temple. And he had to cleave the Mount of Olives, make room to make it as big as he's going to need to make it because it's going to be so large that all the nations will come up and be blessed. So again, nations will go into this time. But the conquest of all the nations is achieved by Messiah's return. There is no other way. I do not see any scripture that tells us any other way for all of the conquests, the battles, the wars, the fighting to be over, except when King Messiah, with that sword, the word of God out of his mouth, says enough. And when he says enough, the whole world, Salvation comes to Israel at that point in time. When Shaol Paul says in Romans 11, and by the way, 9, 10, and 11 are great for Israel. 9 is past, 
10 is present. 11 is future. When he says in, in 11, 25, and 26 that all of Israel will be saved, there are those who grab that and say, See, don't worry about witnessing to a Jewish person. All of Israel is going to be saved. Paul said it. No, he's talking about the nation. He's talking about the land that the Lord is coming back to, but the people at that time that will look up as he is returning, who have had their hearts prepared, who may already be believing or are right there at that edge that, that when they see will be convinced. They will realize, wow, this is the one that we rejected. and He is our Messiah. Blessed be his holy name. When he comes to stop the battle in Israel, they are going to praise him. They are going to see it. the ones who are hanging on for dear life, literally, that have been able to follow the book of Revelation, that knew not to take the mark of the beast, that knew time is coming to an end. He promised it. It's a seven-year period of time on basis of Daniel's 70th week. Well, we know that, that, and I believe a sign for the start of the tribulation is the rapture, so I'm going to put it there. You can argue with me later, but i got all the scriptures to prove my point. That starts time. So they're going to know, well, you know what? There was that, that time when those people disappeared and what they called the rapture. And it's been about six years since then. So I know in this next year, he's going to come back. Mm -hmm. You know what? Thank God they're going to have that. Because look at us when we're in our misery and we think, if I just knew when it would end. If I just knew it was going to come to an end. And when we begin to see that light at the end of the tunnel, we get so rejuvenated, don't we? God's going to help them because it's so horrendous. They need everything they can hang on to. And they are going to pick up this this map and they're going to study it they're going to see it coming alive where we've said we think this means this they're going to say hey this is what it means it's not going to be hard for them to understand and they will know to be looking for messiah's return they'll know that he's coming so again that's how salvation will come to them at that moment in time i don't believe i've given you because we didn't list it one more prophet who spoke the truth. Remember, if they didn't speak truth, they were to be taken out and stoned. They were false prophets. Don't listen to them. But these are the ones who were proven true. Micah, Micah. Go to Micah. Go to Micah chapter 7. And again, there's so much evidence. How can they deny this? I haven't a clue. When you see time after time after time, all saying the same thing. Isaiah was 700 B.C. Micah, I think, is... That's what I was thinking, 500 B.C. Okay, so you got 200 years of difference from there. Uh, Yohanan, 95 A.D. Now you're spreading 800 years. When we can go back further, we'll see it goes back even further. You've got time here. These are people from different times, different walks of life, different backgrounds, different languages. They're all saying the same thing. The... the have you ever tried to get the same story out of three people in the same room? <laughs> you know the hand of God wrote this. You know it is him speaking that these were just his mouthpieces or would not agree. You show me one contradiction in this book and I'll tell you, okay, you know what? It's all over. I can't trust any of it then. But there's not. What appears to be contradictions, we have the answers for. They cannot argue it down. Archaeologically. Oh, I forgot to bring it. I got a new article. They just found an inscription that goes back in temple times again. And it, it's naming Nathan, the servant of Josiah, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I, 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 I is that the one? I have that one. I, I printed it out so I yeah, could share it. I get that one out excited because there's been no proof of this person outside of our Bible until archaeology digs it up. And it just happens to be the right era. Yes. Uh, I think it's 5311 or 5311. 53 is too high. Second Kings, so, yeah. Yeah, you can look it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, 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 and I saw that. And I thought I want to bring it to people because it excites me. Archaeology proves the Bible. Yeah. Oh, there's no one like Pontius Pilate. If there was someone that important, we'd have his name outside of biblical history. There's no way he was a real person. That was spoken all the way up into the 1950s. Guess what archaeology uncovered in the 1950s? And I've seen it. I couldn't read it, but I've seen it because it was in Greek. It is a, it's, it's a 
the stone about it, yay big, I would think at least. In Caesarea, on display, you can see it. Tony's seen it too, and others have gone to Israel. You see his name mentioned, and his name is mentioned with the higher up name of the one who was over him, the Caesar at the time, and then his name. It showed this Pontius Pilate at this time. When did scripture say this Pontius Pilate at this time? It all brought it out. It silenced those mouths. Archaeology, science. They try to say that science and the Bible don't get along. Baloney, and it's not kosher. <laughs> they get along fine. You can get onto creation research science websites who can speak on the scientific level. Scientists with minds better than Rochelle's that will show you how scripture backs up, I'm mean, sorry, science backs up scripture. It does not argue. Let me bring it simply to someone dumb like me, okay? How many studied in our history that this world was flat? You go far enough, you're going to fall off the earth. Columbus, you can't go out and sail around the world. You're going to fall off. Hmm. 700 B.C. Let me just read you one scripture. I'm going to Yeshia, Isaiah. I'm going to chapter 45. I'm going to verse 18. In Isaiah 45, 18, it says, For thus saith the Lord, who created the heavens. Hmm. Got the word here. The one who made it. Let's see what he says. It's going to say the world's flat, right? No. Well, then he gives you this. God himself, who formed the earth and made it, he has established it. You know what? I'm reading the wrong verse for us. This is the one where he didn't create it in vain. Okay. It's still in Isaiah. Well, I gave you the wrong reference. Hang on a minute. Um, okay. Oh, my goodness. Use my brain. But Isaiah 45 is great also. That's going to tell you what Genesis 1, when we are there, it talks about how he didn't create the world in vain. But it talks about, um, let me Google it because I can't think. I've got my mind fried now. Um, Don't fry it, please. No, it will come back. It will come back. Um, oh, goodness. To build my case like this and then drop the ball, forgive me. <laughs> but I will have it in one moment. Isaiah 40, 22. I knew it was Isaiah. I just was in the wrong chapter. Isaiah 40 and 22. It still tells us in Isaiah that it's a God who created who is speaking. But now here is Isaiah 40 and verse 22. It says, it is he, talking about God, is he who sits upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof. Well, if the earth is flat, i call that a square. I would not call that a circle. But Isaiah called it a circle. Do you know Christopher Columbus's mappers were Jewish? Do you think that maybe they had a few hints from their own ancestors that helped them navigate for Columbus? No, you're not going to fall off Columbus. It bends. It's a circle. Isaiah tells us that. Do you know there's even proof that Columbus was a Jewish believer? Very interesting. But what matters is God said it. <laughs> that he was going to Ophir, <laughs> the Philippine area. <laughs> and there are Jews who wandered there, so I know where Tony said. <laughs> okay, but my point being, science on a simple level proves the truth of the Word of God. We're told in Nahum, Nahum 1 and verse 3, that the clouds are made up from the dust of the Lord's feet. What does science tell you clouds are made up of? Dust. Dust. And then the, the, the vapor, the water, you know, forms in it. But clouds are made up of dust. Many a time. Many a time. And like I say, on, for those who need it on a scientific level, the Bible can hold up to them also. I'm not a scientist. I'm not here to give you a science class today, but I can tell you it fits. I can tell you the probabilities of prophecies being fulfilled are astronomically impossible. And I can take you to one person 
his name being Yeshua. And I can tell you that I can prove to you how I know he is the Messiah that was promised because of all the prophecies he fulfilled. Where he was born, who his parents were. Any of you choose that? Anybody here got to choose where they were born? Anybody here got to choose their heritage, their parents, their line? Well, let's take someone who needs to be born in Beit Lechem, and let's complicate it. His Ama, Ima and Abba, his mommy and daddy, are in Nazareth. They're not living in Beit Lechem. And she's nine months pregnant. <laughs> but a decree goes out from a Gentile that makes them leave Nazareth and go down to Beit Lechem. On donkey, on foot, however, I know she didn't take an airplane. <laughs> I know she didn't have a cushy car. I know she didn't have an easy ride. And yet she didn't give birth until she got all the way into Bethlehem. Bethlehem. That's just bad. That's proof. So it says fingerprints don't lie. I give you fingerprints for the Messiah when we study the case for the Messiah. When you get to eight of those, the probability is 10 to the 17th zero that one person can fulfill eight prophecies. That's 10, and now add on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. That's the chance of one person filling eight. And my God, in Yeshua Jesus, when he took on human form to fulfill all that God had promised, almost 300, in fact, actually it's over 300 prophecies by the time Hallelujah. that we're done. And eight of them. You know what? If you take silver dollars, two feet deep, cover the, the, play, the state of Texas, put an X on one. Stir them up. Drop it anywhere you want in that whole state of Texas, as deep as you want, or put it on top, wherever you want. You put one one place. Now, parachute somebody out of a plane into the land of Texas and tell them, walk through the state of Texas any time you want, any time. Reach down and pick up one silver dollar. You can pick it up from on top. You can pick it up from underneath. You can pick it up from the middle. You can pick it up. When you walk for 20 days, you can pick it up on your first day. No stipulations, just pick up one. And your chance that you're going to pick up that one silver dollar that has that X on it is 10 to the 17th power. Do we have an awesome God? Is he amazing? Science, math, archaeology, any way you slice scripture and you come at it, bring your profession to the book. Test it and see. Not one word fails. We have an awesome God. Come way off track. Let's get us back on track. Let's go back to our millennium. Yes. The, the one, I, I think this is the one, the, 20, the second Kings, Kings 23 11, which they mention, well, he says, removed from the uh, entrance to, uh, to the temple of the Lord, the horses of the king of Judah. Had dedicated to the sun. They were in court in the court near the room of the of an official named Nathan Melek. I think that's the one that you're talking I about. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yes, that sounds right. And I will bring the article next week. But that was Second Kings. And what was it that, they, that his name was on it? Was that on a um, some kind of a a signet ring, uh, like a seal? A signet. Okay, that's what it was. Yes, a signet ring. yes, which signet. holds power. The same way that we've seen the seal, the seal. Uh, on the 144,000, the seal of the Holy Spirit on us, the seal of the king when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, the seal on the tomb when they tried to keep Yeshua in the tomb. <laughs> what a joke. <laughs> that same thing. So it, it showed, you know, I mean, that's why you would find it because it was something very important, you know, that, that was used back then. And it fit with the names and the time and everything. So I'll bring you that article and we'll get that on the video. We'll, we'll announce what it is specifically at the time, but I believe you're right from what I'm remembering. I think that the child is trying to prove that it's not from Bethlehem. It says Bethlehem, Ephraim. 
Very good. Very good. Bethlehem Ephrata. There were two Bethlehems. It made it specific which one. It, everything. And again, I could go on and on and on. That's another class. We will follow this class between whatever book we pick up next after Revelation. We will follow it with um, sharing our uh, our faith with our Jewish uh, friends, loved ones, neighbors, <laughs> however you want to put it. And I'll bring you the case for the Messiah in that. If that isn't an exciting class, nothing is. <laughs> it builds also. It gets you real excited. But right now we're excited because we've got King Messiah. He's the conquest of the nations. Salvation has come to Israel. I've already quoted to you Zechariah, Zechariah 12, 10. We listed him last time, but that's the one where it says that they will see him who they have pierced and that they will mourn for him. So I think I've covered that well enough. We see in the millennium, we're not going to read it right now for sake of time, but we'll read it next week. <laughs> Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3, are that Satan, Satan, is controlled. He is bound during the thousand-year time. That's why this line that represents Satan all through time, he is the prince of the power of the air. He works in the principalities of the power of the air. He comes down and indwells the Antichrist at the halfway point of the tribulation. He comes all the way through the end of the tribulation. The Antichrist and the false prophet, we know, got a, a swift ticket all the way over past great white throne judgment into the lake of fire forever. We'll go back and see that when we look at the great white throne judgment, that they're already there and still there. But at this point, Satan is not cast into the lake of fire. His work's not completely done. He is brought down into the bottomless Hit into the uh, abyss. Yes, again, hallelujah. The one who is a thorn in our side, the one who is the deceiver, the one who is the liar, the one who the is. Troublemaker. I'm sorry? The troublemaker. The troublemaker. The, the great dragon, the old serpent, all of that. And we're going to look at those names in, I think it's verse 3, but we're going to see he is bound during the whole thousand years. He is not able to affect the people during that time. He's not going to be doing to them what he's doing to you and, and me today. You ever heard him whisper in your ear? Yeah, he gets you to do something and he condemns you for it. You know, he trips you up in all kinds of ways. He won't get to do that. You don't want to remember. Exactly. And when he reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. And, and, and if he comes knocking on your door, send Yeshua Jesus the answer. Don't answer it, send him the answer. Okay. We also will see, and so we won't look at it because next class we will, in verses 4 through 6 of Revelation 20, is the believers that have been rewarded ruling and reigning with Messiah. Okay, now remember, we got rapture. I believe this is when the Bema seat of Messiah, of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ takes place, where we receive reward. Because when we come back down with him, we're wearing our reward. We're in our our robes of righteousness, which is part of our reward. We get the robe and we get our crowns. We know that we're probably already cast our crowns at his feet out of our choice because we want to keep him something. But we are wearing those robes, so we have to have been up here at the judgment seat to receive that. Now, notice that judgment seat takes place in heaven, and I stress that. Because people get confused and they think you're working for your salvation. If that were true, before you got into heaven, there'd be a stop. You know how you have to stop and get checked to get in the airport somewhere now? There'd be a scale there. Okay, step up. All right, put all your good works here. Put all your bad works here. Let's see which way the scale goes. Oh, this one's going to be close. You just made it in. Go ahead and go through the pearly gate and say, Peter, because you know, we might as well take it to the hill opens the gate for you. That doesn't happen, does it? You're in heaven. Oh, hallelujah. You are in heaven when you're standing at the judgment seat. You've already been accepted in. Well, what opened heaven for you to get in? The blood. the blood, yes, not one work, not one thought, not one anything, you came through the blood, that's how God looks at us, through the blood, he put his blood on the mercy seat in heaven, 
the one on earth was just patterned after he put it on the mercy seat in heaven and he opened up heaven so Paul could say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And the Lord's not in the heart of the earth anymore. You don't go down to the to the, the paradise side of Sheol. Now you go straight into heaven. When the rapture occurs, we're going to blast heaven. We're going to come in. Well, I'm not coming in single file. i got news for you. I'm gonna, I'll go over your hands and get there. Well, Sheol is not going to say hi to us at all. <laughs> In the millennium, it talks about ten Gentiles grabbing the skirt of a Jew to go up to worship the Lord. So ten, you can grab hold of my skirt as I go up, and I'm going first. <laughs> I used to tell my really tall girlfriend that she'd say, you got to get started because I'm heads over you. And I said, yeah, but little goes faster. <laughs> so, we grab on <laughs> No worries, because the blood's going to get you. Exactly. In, and that's why we're there for reward or loss of reward, not for salvation. Don't ever confuse that. For reward or loss of reward. When we come back to rule and reign with him on this earth during the millennial time, if you've been a faithful doer of what God's given you to do, he can entrust you to rule for him also. If you've been lousy at it, you're not going to be ruling with him. It's just, just simple. We'll go into those scriptures very shortly, and we'll look at that. My dad used to say, present training for future reigning. Good way to put it. That's what you're standing there for, is for those rewards. We're going to see, because we'll go through Matthew 25, we're going to look at those parables, because they're so confusing to people. I want to give that to you, because that's who goes into the millennium. In fact, they analyzed you last week. We've got to wait one more week, because we started late, and we talked too long. I talked too long. But we're going to see who goes in, that, that uh, they, they're rewarded by going into the millennium. It's not what we're talking about. We're, we've already been raptured. We've already returned with them. We're talking about this earthly people. But we're going to see by the talents that one who was given 10 pounds and one who was given 5 pounds, they both doubled it. They both were faithful. But it, it's, in essence, I could say, okay, I don't want to get into politics, so i got to get away from that. i got to think of another way to say it. Let's just take a school, okay? In a school, the principal has the most responsibility. The teachers have lesser responsibility than the principal, but they have a lot of responsibility too. So it would be like the principal is given 10 talents and the teachers were given five talents. And each did everything they were supposed to do. So the principal turned his 10 talents into 20. The teacher turned her five, or his five, into 10. They were both fully faithful. They both received a full reward. They both would receive positions of rulership. But again, maybe that principal will rule over the United States and the teacher would rule over California. Now, I don't mean those literally, okay? But I'm just trying to break it down for you. The one who took his one talent and went and hit it, didn't even put it at the bank where it could at least get interest. He's not going to rule anywhere. But you notice... Yeah, it, it, it's not, it, it's not, again, what we're talking about is ruling and reigning with him. We're talking about what's going on during the millennium. This is people on earth. This is not the ones who've been at the Bema Seat already who've received their rewards. So don't confuse the two. The same way Matthew 24 is not the rapture. Remember, everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, but most people want to put the rapture there. Two are taken. And they think the one went in, or two in the field, one's taken. And they think the one got taken to heaven. But when they were taken, as it was in the days of Noah, they were taken away in judgment. The flood took them away. They were judged. The one who, who is taken away is taken away in judgment. That's not talking about the rapture there. And when you follow Matthew 24, you follow it through the tribulation time. You come to the end of 24, you have the return of the second coming. Not rapture, second coming. When you get done with that, Chapter 25, you've got the virgins, you've got the talents, you've got the sheep and goat judgment. It's all telling you who's going to populate the kingdom, who gets to go in, who gets the reward of the kingdom, who doesn't. What's it based on? Their works. Why? Because their works prove where their heart was. So total different than us. Okay? We'll look at all that next week.
uh, sheep and goat judgment, all of that. So I'm jumping real quickly. We'll go to the point that the construction of Ezekiel's temple, Ezekiel, that temple is accomplished by the Messiah. This also confuses people. You hear now that they're trying to build the temple in Israel now. There's the Temple Mount Faithful. They have the cornerstone. They have the priestly robes. They have all of the art, art, articles, everything that they need to do their worship in the temple is already made. They have all that, that what you read that was in the temple before or in the tabernacle. They have everything. They're ready. They have them in a place that they're keeping them, and they show you them. But they clarify to you when they're showing them to you. You're not in a museum. These are going to be taken right out and put right into the temple as soon as we can build our temple. They've taken that cornerstone up to the Temple Mount at least three times that I know of and tried to lay the cornerstone to start building the temple. That roar is so great, the police stopped them. You can't do it. You can't do it. Remember, Temple Mount area is in Arab hands right now. Israel keeps control for safety but allows the Muslims, because they've got two mosques up there, to do their thing because Israel respects their religious belief, whatever you want to call it, okay? A lot of controversy there. In God's timing, we know there will be what I call the third temple because we've had two already. We've had Solomon's, David set it up, Solomon did it, and then we had the, the rebuild, the one that was destroyed in 70 yeah, Herod's, Herod's that was there when Yeshua went into the temple, he went into Herod's temple, okay? It, it actually started in Ezra and Nehemiah rebuilding, and then Herod did a lot to refurbish it also, but it never had the glory that the first had. So the third temple is the one I read about in the tribulation because in the middle of the tribulation, when the Antichrist is indwelt by Satan, who's always wanted, I'm God, I'm going to be worshipped, so I'm going to get my worship through that man that we call the Antichrist. He's going to have a normal name. He's not going to be called the Antichrist. I mean, there'll be those who know that's who he is because they've studied the Word of God and they'll know. But he'll have his name. Um, I'm trying to think what David Jeremiah called him in his book. Um, Judas Christopher. <laughs> so, so my my uh, my hat off to David Jeremiah. I'll borrow his name. Yeah. Judas Judas Christopher is indwelt, and he, I know he used that name because Judas was indwelt by Satan. We saw that the yeah. son of perdition. Here's your second one. At that point in time, when he uh, when he does this. It says that he puts the image in the temple and he causes the sacrifices to stop. Well, the sacrifices can only be done in the temple at Jerusalem. Not Temple Utah, not Temple anywhere else, not even Temple Samaria. It has to be the temple in Jerusalem. So if in the middle of the tribulation you've got the Antichrist putting his image in the temple to be worshipped as God and you've got sacrifices stopping, then obviously... There's been a temple there that's active. That's not there today. Now, does that have to happen before we can go home? No. no. Can it happen before we go home? Yeah. yeah. Do I think it will? No. no. Do I think it's going to get a big kickstart by the Antichrist, by the rapture, and the Antichrist making a false peace treaty? Yes. Yeah. 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 Might even be, maybe, that the Ark of the Covenant that I think they really have found might be brought out. And the Antichrist, because he wants to make peace with the Jews, could say, hey, you've got your Ark, build your temple. We're going to live side by side in peace, remember? So we'll keep peace up there between the Muslims and the Jews. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe that Muslim fight has to go. It doesn't have to for room that I have a hard time with an Orthodox Jew and the Muslim side by side. Unless they build a wall. <laughs> so, see, I don't know how, but I'm telling you, if you see it happen, don't let that shake your faith and think, oh, I missed the rapture. No, it could happen. Does it have to happen? No. Likelihood won't, but it will very early on in the tribulation to be stopped at the three and a half year point. How fast can they build that temple? Very fast. With technology today, they've got it in no time. That temple is not Ezekiel 40 to 48. Ezekiel 40 to 48 is very clear. 
the size that it's given is not the size of the, that you'll see in the tribulation because there's no room for that size. But more importantly, the most important point is the one from chapter 40 on is filled with the glory of the Lord. And the Shekhinah glory will go through. Now we're told that the Lord is going to come through the eastern gate and make his way to the temple. So we know that that happens by Messiah. So that temple that Hezekiel is describing is what's called the Millennial Temple. It will be during the millennium. It will be used. They will have sacrifices going on. We'll look at that. I think it's to be an object lesson to people who otherwise would not know the high cost of salvation. They wouldn't understand. But that picture is going to be such a, a wow, I get it. And how many of us understand better with a picture than just with words? They'll be doing it. They also will be doing the sacrifices of praise, the sacrifices that honor God. All of that will be going on. Now, keep Ezekiel in order. Chapter 37, Israel's back in the land, dry bones, spirit of God not in her. Ezekiel 38 and 39, I think I proved to you, is Battle of Armageddon. Because 38 and 39 tell us several times at the end of that battle, they will know I am the Lord. The world will know I am the Lord. Israel will know I am her God. When is that going to happen? Only when the Lord sets up his kingdom. They're not going to know it before. All the way through the tribulation, we're close to the end, and they're still blaspheming God. They're still fist in his face. They're not saying, we know. The whole world is not saying. The whole world right now says, ha, there's not a God. This world evolved. So foolish, I won't even give it an answer right now, except to say so foolish. Anyone who can believe that this world evolved. And, and mind you, there can't be a God, but there can be slime in a riverbank. There can be a collision. It can suddenly decide to divide the male and female. It can suddenly decide to after its own kind. So a puppy gives birth to a puppy, and a human gives birth to a human, and you don't find anything in between anywhere. And yet, all of that I'm supposed to believe it takes more faith to believe in that than it does to believe in God. You know, your fairy tales tell you that you kiss a frog and it becomes a prince. <laughs> That's a fairy tale. And then you grow up and they want you to believe it's true. Oh, you came from a frog. You came from a monkey. You came from a monkey. I just went to the Museum of Anthropology and History, and there's a whole section of the museum. Yeah. Yeah. came from the monkey. But, again, to keep that on track, to get myself back on track, 38 39, Battle of Armageddon. 40 to 48, the temple, in all its detail, filled with the Shekhinah glory of God. It talks about how it's filled with the glory. That's only going to be in the millennium. So, technically, the millennial kingdom, uh, temple, will be the fourth temple. Okay? Because there is going to be a third that the Antichrist is going to destroy himself with his presence in what is John in it. Okay? So. The center, uh, oh, you know what, let me give you some verses to back that up real fast, because I, I don't want to just, it's not just my word. Um, Isaiah 2, 1 to 5, and we're going to see that with Ezekiel. But go to Isaiah first, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, and we read, and I'm going to hurry, the word which Yeshua, Isaiah the son of Amos said concerning Judah and Jerusalem, now will come about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. Okay? House of the Lord on the chief of the mountains in Jerusalem, last days. We know when this is. It will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. Obviously, we're talking millennial. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Yaakov that he may teach us concerning his ways, and we may walk in his paths, for the law will go forth from Zion, from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Yerushalayim. He will judge between the nations. I told you we're going to look at that judgment. He will render decisions for many peoples, that's the Jews. They will hammer their swords into plowshares, that means no more war. Their spears and their pruning hooks. The nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. We've got wars. We know there's wars. We're on the brink of war in many areas right now. Korea, Russia, Iran, Iraq, 
Look at what Gaza is doing to Israel. Look at what Syria is doing to Israel. Poor Lebanon gets caught in the middle. The Lebanese people, I pity them. They get run over all the time by Syria, by Russia, by Iraq, by Iran. They're in the crossfire of all that's going on. That's not peace. That's not knowing their God. Verse 5, house of Yaakov, Jewish people, let us walk in the light of the Lord. For you have abandoned your people, the house of Yaakov, because they are filled with influences from the east. They are soothsayers like the Philistines. Okay, and it goes on. This is where they are today, that they're, they're full of the, the idolatry. But they're going to walk in the light of the Lord in that day. I should have stopped with that a little earlier. Keep that all in mind and run with me to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 44. Remember I told you that from 40 on, we're talking about the temple that he is going to uh, fill with his presence. Ezekiel 44, 4. Then he brought me by way of the north gate to the front of the house. This is the temple. He's just calling it house because it's the house of God. I looked, Ezekiel, I looked and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord and I fell on my face. Okay, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Did we just talk about the house of the Lord in Isaiah, seeing the glory of the Lord there? Yes, so it goes together. Now, let me give you, oh, we didn't put Ezekiel up. Here's another one. Okay, another who gives prophecies for Israel. Let's talk about it. And now Amos, you call him Amos. We're going to look at his little book. Thank you. I forgot to put Micah up here. Micah. Yes, Micah. Okay. By the time we get them, we're going to have so many, I'm going to run out of room. <laughs> okay, we're going to Amos, Amos chapter 9. Amos. He's one of the real little books. Hosea, Joel, Amos. If that helps you, I'm not going to give you time because I'm fighting that clock. I want to try to finish in five minutes. In that day, if it's the same day we've been just talking about, Amos chapter 9 and verse 11. Okay. In that day, I will raise up the fallen booth of David. What's the booth of David? Okay, and is it David himself, his personal house where he goes and sleeps and eats? No, it's his family. Okay, okay, I'm going to get a little more specific. Tony just said the tabernacle. The tabernacle is called a booth, okay? The tabernacle, a booth of David. That's the house of David. That's what the temple became. Okay, because remember the temple was the permanent where the tabernacle could travel with them. Okay, so in that day he's going to raise up the fallen booth of David. Do we have the tabernacle today? No, no. The the last that that land knew the tabernacle was Shiloh, the area of Shiloh where it was it, it had space for it. That's northern Israel. But then Shiloh wasn't used anymore when they had the temple. When you read Ruth, Ruth, uh, Ruth Boaz probably have gone up to Shiloh comes back when um, Ruth and Naomi have come. It's probably where he's gone, gone and done his worship, taking his first fruits to the temple, okay, to the booth, to the tabernacle. Okay, when you're saying the, the booth, or is that the same thing as when they were talking about the festival of booths when all the people were living in? No, because that's talking, that's Sukkot, and that's talking Sukkot. about reminding them how, how they dwelt in booths, they dwelt in... Uh, temporary oh, dwelling places yeah. during the time of wander. Yeah, yeah. No, because that goes further back. That's Moshe's time, Moses' time, which is 1400 BC. No, that's okay. It's a good question. David's 900 BC. David's the one giving credit for the house of the Lord because even though Shlomo Solomon his son built it, David put it all together. He got all the plans, all the material. That his hands were bloody hands with war. That couldn't build the house of God, so his son got the pleasure. Okay. But that's why it's called the Book of David. This is his, okay. his little baby, okay? Wall, wall up its breaches, I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. Okay, it's going to go on. I don't want to keep reading this. I'm, I'm fighting time. But there's a fallen boot that's going to be raised up. I'm going to read other verses that you will see follow on that. But right now, go to Zechariah. 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 Come on, go back for me. Zechariah, I'm on the tablet. There we go. Zechariah, we are going to chapter um, 6. Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Any of you have been around? Uh, 
our ministry that has a head name that is over many other branches. Very good. Samak. That's what you're going to read here. I'll put it up here. In English, we spell it with the S, but you can also see it sometimes T-Z. Samak is the name I'm going to use. These are the verses we pulled it from when, when we gave birth to it. Bioe just for history, which you'll hear probably on Saturday. Um, Pastor Gil and I were both trying to come up with a name for our new developing work. We were throwing out different names. We hadn't come on anything. Of course, we're both praying. All of a sudden, I came up with Samoth in Hebrew right when he came up with the branch in English. And it was asking me, what's the branch in Hebrew? And I was saying Samoth. And we looked at each other and said, a name is born. <laughs> we knew it was what God wanted. And I have seen, yes, behold. <laughs> and I have seen his hand and his reason for that name. It, when he puts his name on something, whoa, he is awesome. Okay, then say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Adonai Sabaoth, Behold, hello, a man. Okay, a man. Because Yeshua, the one called the branch, the shoot of Jesse that we read about, the, the, the branch that was a supernatural branch. Okay, that's all tying in here. The, the man, uh, behold, a man whose name is the branch, whose name is Samoth in our Hebrew. Uh, I lost my place. Uh, for he will branch out from where he is. He will build the temple of the Lord. Who does it? He does it. Yes, it is he who builds the temple of the Lord, and he who will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Well, we just said Yeshua is going to build that temple in the millennium. He's going to sit on his throne in Yerushalayim. He's not going to sit just in the heavens. He's always in the heaven also, in the presence of God. But he's going to sit in his humanity on his earthly throne, in Yerushalayim, in the house of the Lord, the temple which he has built. And notice, this one who sits and rules, okay, so he has the ruling authority, that's kingly authority, thus he will be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace will be between those two offices. Hey, wait a minute. I thought the priest came from the Levites and the king came from Judah. Remember when I brought you out Melchizedek earlier and I said that Melchizedek, my God is king, was a picture of Messiah? And he was given tithes and offerings, which is brought to the priest. We see in Melchizedek a picture of Messiah, who is, yes, king, and yes, priest. Because we know he was a high priest for us. Hebrews tells us that all over the place. That he was the greater, the Kohen Gadol, the great high priest. This was the high priest who once for all put the sacrificial blood on the mercy seat. But this wasn't the priest that died never to raise again like all the human priests before. And this wasn't blood put on the mercy seat on earth. This was in his temple in heaven because this was the high priest who, yes, would die so that his blood could be spilt, but this is the one who would rise from the dead and live forever. This is the one who is, yes, a high priest, put the blood on the mercy seat in heaven, and yes, he is king. My God is king. He is both. And between those two, being our priest and our king, we have shalom. That's what Israel's going to experience. A thousand years of shalom because their king is on the throne and their priest has done it all. And they come to the priest for the mercy that he exudes through that blood. Wow. What a picture. What how amazing is our God. That's why the temple's got to be there. That's part of the millennium to make it the millennium. It will be uh, the center of world government. Ah. Okay, I'm going to give you a couple points and we'll close. The center of world government, Jerusalem, where he's going to rule to, for the world to the world, Psalm 48. Are we okay going a couple more minutes? Yes, sure. Okay, Psalm 48. You okay? Okay. <laughs> Psalm 48, we'll start with verse 1. Great is the Lord, hallelujah, greatly to be praised in the city of our God, his holy mountain. Where is that? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Zion. Zion. Yes, but we've just been talking about beautiful in elevation. The joy of the whole Whoa. earth is Mount Zion 
in the far north, the city of the great king. God in her palaces has made himself known as a stronghold. Right there, the center of worship, the center for the world to know, the place that, that is elevated, the holy mountain, is earthly, Yerushalayim. Verse 8, as we have heard, so have we seen, in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish her forever. Forever. Not for a time, forever. Uh, Isaiah backs this up, Zephaniah backs it up. You have the cross references for the sake of the video Isaiah 65, 17 to 25. And Zephaniah 3, 16 and 17. I'll pick these up in a quick review next week. Uh, but it shows that Check the Lord out is results. ruling from there. And I think we've covered that point today. Jewish worship will be restored from there. I've already touched on that. Let's just look real quick at Isaiah 66. Bless you. Isaiah 66. And we're going to look at verses 20 to 24, but I want to stop off at one verse, I think, on the way. I'm going to stop off at verse 7, because God fulfills all of his words. Isaiah 66, Isaiah 66, verse 7, says, Before she travailed, before she brought forth, before her pain came, she gave birth to a boy. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Can a land or can a nation be born in a day? Yes. yes. What happened in 1948? Yeah. A nation was born in a day. Actually, a rebirth, but born in a day. God fulfilling, putting Israel back in her land. A people have been out of land for 2,000 years. No other people out of their land have remained a people for that length of time, but for the Jew. Because God had to put them back in that land to fulfill the promises. Now drop down to verses 20 to 24 real quickly, and we read there. Then shall you, uh, then they shall bring all your brethren from all the nations as a grain offering to the Lord. And it tells how they come all kinds of ways to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, just as the sons of Israel bring their grain offering and clean vessels to the house of the Lord. You see the same talk, the same verbiage. The house of the Lord in Jerusalem, all the nations coming into it. So you see that they're they're doing the Jewish worship, but they're all coming in. They're all being a, a part of it. I already told you that they'll be bringing up the grain offering and other things. This is one that gives it. Um, again, other verses, Hezekiel, Ezekiel 45, 18 to 25, um, chapter 48, and verse 35, and Zechariah, Zechariah 14, 16. Um, the last point, and again, these that I'm hurrying over, I'll start with next week so that we get them, you know, and don't uh, miss them. But the battle with Satan has him confined during this time, and then we're going to see he's let loose for a little bit. He wreaks havoc through the face of the earth, and he comes up to his demise. We'll see that he is cast into the lake of fire. That's why you see the, the line going down. He will go into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. Proof that it's not annihilation. Proof that when it says forever, it means forever. They're still there a thousand years later. Satan will be cast in the lake of fire also. Can you imagine the hurrah that's going to go up from the face of the earth and the heavens and all of are going to be declaring hallelujah to our God. The victory is won forever. Never to come back, never a lie to come in, never something to start again. And then we will go on and see what happens after that millennium. But we're going to come back next week and just barely talk about the end, the worship and the sacrifice and all that's going on, and show you how Satan gets cast into that. <laughs> Sherry. A question, I'm sorry, to, I hope this isn't too lengthy, but okay. We're going to be raptured in the air. Okay. But you said not all of, okay, we're up there now in heaven. Okay. But not all of us are coming back to reign with Jesus on earth. We will be in the new Jerusalem above earth. I I believe I can't tell you whether we all come back how it is, but the ones that rule and reign with him on the earth will be the ones that are rewarded for being for the faithfulness. It says that they'll rule and reign with him. But the rest of us will be in the new Jerusalem. Yeah, I guess so, if we haven't come with him. But it talks about him coming with all his army.
army. So I tend to think that the, the others who are not given a position to roll and reign will be spectating. They may be they may be up in heaven, but I think they're gonna to want to see what's going on. I don't know. He comes back with his armies. Yeah. And see the armies, everybody's going to be dressed in the robe of righteousness. Nobody's in that in that army without the robe, because you're not in heaven without his righteousness. So I tend to think it they're all we're all gonna come back. The, you know, the angels come back, we who have been raptured come back, but then he'll assign positions. And, and there'll be others who will be, like I say, watching, spectating, seeing, but won't be given the honor and the privilege of, of rulership because they do. Oh, yeah. do but there'll be jobs, probably something you can do. But oh, I can't imagine there'll be something in the drugs. I can't imagine there'll be something in the drugs. I can't imagine there'll be something in the drugs. I can't imagine there'll be something in the drugs. Yeah, yeah, I really can't. Yeah. 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 There are chips that are going to be Indian. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, only those Indians won't need won't need uh, to be ruled like the first. Someone has to. When you were talking about the fourth kingdom, mm -hmm. when the branch you said the Lord Himself will build the temple. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was yes. not built by human hands. Right. Oh. Right. Oh. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, okay. yeah. That will be a part of it too, which also shows the wonder and generation is not that one. It's a sweet one, even now. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. He'll create, yeah, yeah. Because I, I mean, he can do however he wants, but I can't imagine he's going to have a crew, uh, you know, a cement pour overs and that sort of thing. But I, I question, I wonder, what will the millennial look like? What will people dwell in? You know, I cannot imagine asphalt and you know, on the high rises. And how will everybody get up to Jerusalem to... We're going to fly. <laughs> We're going to fly. Uh, Those are are you going to fly on angels' wings or on TWA? <laughs> <laughs> the Lord will let me just fly, get there, I've cleaned it. You're not, not going to be doing that. No, no, no. You're going to be Stop. on the other end. <laughs> Those are going to go through will be transporters. After just after the millennium and they release Satan, I notice that it don't show him going back in the air. So is he gonna like be draining on earth to deceive the Satan? So he's yes. gonna go over the face of the earth. Yeah, he's going to gather those who want to follow him. His intent is to come up in the face of God. He's going to come take him on because he wants to leave from God and set himself up as God. So it says he comes up on the circumference well, of the earth. Can people be to turn away from Jesus and go with the Lord? Eric, I just can't imagine how people would come I don't get it either, but why do people follow him today? Exactly. What are they doing now? And, 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 and I, I got another thing to say. Okay, as far as the church age today, I'm kind of ashamed of it because we all have the Holy Spirit and, and they want to sit and talk about the people that before that didn't have it. I, I don't know, I'm just kind of ashamed of it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, he's saying we have such an advantage because yeah. we're all each personally indwelt 24-7. Yeah. We don't have the Holy Spirit coming and going like they did back in the uh, original Testament times where they are faulting Israel. Well, they didn't do what they should do, and, and Eric said, "Well, we've given up the Holy Spirit within us permanent, and we're not doing what we should do." And so, we're not doing no better. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, where's not. where's the people that are filled with the Holy Spirit? Why ain't they doing right, right. things that are, we're supposed to be doing more than what Jesus right. did? Where if, are they? If at? we were really the we shining at? example that we should be, the world would be running to the Lord because they yeah. would see such a difference where's in us. Church? Oh wow, they've got answers. They've got it. You know, they got all together. Yeah. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we're not living up to that. Yeah. But we'll talk about why those people are deceived. Why do they follow us on? They've had a thousand years of peace. Why do they do that? We'll get all those questions hopefully next yeah. week. Okay? Right. I got to call us to a close. If you want to stay and talk after you can, but I've got it too. I told the video you all this was gonna be a shorter one. Well, forget <laughs> that. That's on the two CDs. <laughs> But um, I, I, I appreciate the, the conversation, you know, I want us to share and bring you questions. 
Um, let me close in prayer, and if there are other questions that don't want to wait for next week, we'll take them, okay? Yes. But those who need to go can. Lord God, you are awesome and amazing. The fact that you have masterminded such a plan that has included people of all times through the ages, from the first to the very last, it is just amazing in our sight, Lord. We thank you for the privilege of studying and knowing. We thank you for seeing your faithfulness today and knowing that you will be faithful tomorrow. We thank you that you are the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We thank you that you keep your word. We thank you that we have no fear of our salvation. We rejoice and we look and long for the day when you come back and reveal to the world who you are. Set up that kingdom. We can rule and reign with you. And Lord, even more glorious, we can hardly wait till when Satan is cast into the lake of fire forever. And we can go on praising you throughout eternity. However, wherever, oh Lord, can't wait to see what you have in store. But thank you. You've encouraged our hearts today in you. We praise you and we thank you that if you are in control of such a mastermind, such a plan through the ages, then we know that you are very aware of the moment in time that we are in, the trial that is ours today, the need for your hand at this moment. And Lord, we trust it to you, knowing that you will also take care of what concerns us now. So let us praise you. Let us walk in our faith to please you, glorify your holy name, and start rejoicing with the heavenly choruses even now. We praise you, Lord God Almighty, God of heaven and earth, our Redeemer, our Savior, our Messiah. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. In your precious name. Amen. 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 Okay. What a class. <laughs> I